All right. Um, I hope that you guys are all doing well um, and that things are, are going okay for you all. Um, I am still feverishly working on getting my act together and getting caught back up. The really great news about that is that after this class, I just have to sit in my office and get caught up on things until the talk tonight at 7. And, and so I'm really hoping that it's going to be a very productive afternoon, except for maybe like get lunch. But other than that, it's going to be a very productive afternoon. Um, so I should have lots more info for you guys uh, coming up. Um, I will send you an email about this before Friday. Um, but just as in a general thing, if you look at the schedule, it says you have an assignment due on Friday, given that I haven't even given you the assignment. It's kind of hard for it to be due on Friday. Um, so I mean, the, one of the things I'm trying to do is sort of look at the assignments for the rest of the semester and do some kind of arranging of things. And so that's one of those topics on my list for this afternoon. Um, and when I have that figured out, I'll email it to you and we'll also talk about it on Friday. Um, so just know that, no, there is nothing due on Friday and future stuff is upcoming. Um, today, I want to finish telling you a few things related to NK cells that I didn't get through last time, um, and then move into talking about peripheral tolerance. Um, the peripheral tolerance lecture sort of comes at an interesting point um, in the semester for everyone. Um, so if you ask most of my previous students, they will tell you that the peripheral tolerance lecture is the first lecture of clinical immunology. Um, if you ask me, I would say it's the last lecture that's not clinical immunology, and the next one starts clinical immunology, so we're kind of right at that cutoff borderline. Um, the way that I like to think about this is that I'm going to talk about mechanisms of peripheral tolerance today, kind of what it should look like, and then on Friday, I'm going to talk about how they get broken um, in terms of uh, autoimmunity. Um, and so um, today is going to be more of the what it should look like, then next time we'll see how it could go wrong. But first, like I said, I want to finish a couple of things about NK cells. And if you remember, in our discussion of NK cells, we were thinking a lot about trying to decide whether NK cells were more innate um, or were more adaptive, and whether we would classify them as part of the innate immune system or the adaptive immune system. So what types of things do you recall uh, sort of putting NK cells into either the innate or adaptive category? Yeah, Kyra. Okay, so they come, the NK cells come from a lymphoid lineage, um, which make, which is like the adaptive immune system. Awesome. What else? Yeah, Emma. Okay. So they, their receptors don't undergo VDJ recombination. They're just encoded by normal little genes. So that's more like an innate immune response. Ashley. So they have a uh, fast response. So that's more like an innate immune response. Um, they're not super pathogen specific. So that's more of an innate type of thing. Um, anything else that you remember and feel like you want to like, bring up in terms of innate versus adaptive on NK cells? I mean, I think that those are some of the relatively major points. Um, so based on all of that, would you, class if your job was to make the immunology syllabus or course schedule, or your job was to write the textbook, um, are you going to classify them as innate or adaptive cells? Yeah, Alexis. Why aren't they doing this? So in a lot of ways, people think about NK cells as being cells of the innate immune system. And... Um, in most places that you read about them and hear about them, you will hear about them as innate immune cells for exactly the reasons that Alexis points out. Even though it may not always feel super clear, 
um, you sort of feel like, okay, there are sort of more checks in the innate column than in the adaptive column. Um, and that has, was sort of the, the messy but answer. <laughs> um, particularly like as I was finishing graduate school. And then it got even messier. Um, and so I want, in the next few slides, I want to kind of show you a few additional things that we now know that we've picked up since then and how that changes our overall big picture view of this innate versus adaptive uh, piece of information. And so one really cool set of experiments. Um, I had a bunch of slides about these experiments and then I sort of just limited it down a little bit here, is that um, there was a demonstration that NK cells could have a memory phenotype. Um, so there can be an NK cell that's sort of a naive type of cell. Um, it can become activated. This was first described with NK cells being activated um, in response to this one specific virus with this one specific receptor. But we now are like, okay, we actually see it in more than just this unique case. For a little while, people were like, maybe it's just this one weird case. But it seems more broad now. So we can actually get clonal expansion of those NK cells that have been activated, just like you saw with adaptive cells when we talked about kinetics of the response. And the cells that are present after a contraction phase are really different in how they act than were the earlier kind of naive cell. So we kind of have this long-lived experienced cell. Um, if you put those cells in a dish, they're better at killing than they were before. So they've improved as sort of like a memory type cell, just the way a memory CD8 cell would work. And if you put those cells into um, immunodeficient mice, those immunodeficient mice are protected from infection. Um, and naive cells also can't do that. And so again, this looks suddenly like sort of the kinetics and memory piece um, that we see with adaptive immune responses. And so again, before we were like, okay, they're innate with a little bit of adaptive stuff. And then we started to see this sort of kinetics and memory thing. And we were like, oh man, memory is definitely one of those big defining factors of innate, uh, of adaptive immunity. So now it's getting messy again. And after, um, Sort of that understanding, we started to realize that originally we kind of thought of innate immune cells as making these nice early responses that were the same the first and second time one was infected with a microbe. But we've now realized that the NK cells are actually kind of making different responses the first and second time. And we do kind of see this memory like NK response. Um, and at that point, it was sort of like the immunologists were like, we're going to just throw it up in the air. NK cells are just NK cells. Like, we're tired of this division business. Um, and you can see in my placing these in the course schedule, I just kind of gave them their own day and kind of let them be in their own place. But as we have continued to understand aspects of immunology, there have been some other interesting things that have been discovered. And the big picture idea here is that we found that NK cells aren't the only weird cells. So there are some other cells that seem to have some properties of innate immunity and some properties of adaptive immunity. And this nice clear distinction I gave you at the beginning of the semester is actually, in some cases, a little bit muddy. If you look back to lecture number two, I showed you this exact slide, and I told you that lymphocytes were cells of the adaptive immune system. And I showed you um, our hematopoietic stem cell generating a lymphoid precursor and then potentially making B cells or T cells. We've also realized that, of course, this cell can make NK cells, but it turns out there are some other weird kinds of cells that can be made by the cell type too. And 
if we group all of these cells together, we often refer to them as ILCs. Um, ILC standing for innate lymphoid cell. So they're cells that have innate properties, but they come from the lymphoid precursor. And so it turns out it's not just NK cells that are kind of weird. Um, there are also these other types of ILCs that are uh, a little bit weird. Um, when we were thinking about um, NK cells and doing our compare and contrast, there was one other thing that we noted about NK cells in terms of similarities to other cell types that we had talked about before. So what was the other similarity we saw with NK cells compared to some other cells that we've seen before? Think about how NK cells do their function, what their function is and how they do it. Yeah, Kyra. Uh, so they use receptors, um, but their receptors are a bit different because they're not made by VDJ. But there is something else that there's part of their function that's um, similar. Yeah, Vicky. Yeah, so they are, their job is to kill other cell types. And they do that by using perforin and granzyme, potentially fast ligand, potentially some interferon gamma, all the same things that CTLs use for their function. It turns out when we look at some of these different types of innate lymphoid cells, we can see parallels to immune cells that you've already seen as well. And so what we find is that this pre precursor cell that could have become a B cell or a T cell can start to make a bunch of different other um, innate lymphoid cell types. Um, the One of the things that's unique about some of these innate lymphoid cell types, these ILC types um, coming from this precursor, is that they all tend to have a particular transcription factor that they make as they are developing. And so you can see some of their transcription factors here, like TBET and GATA3 and WAR gamma T. Does any of that sound familiar at all? Yes, I see your head shaking, yes. What's, sound, what's familiar about it? Yeah, Emma. Yeah, so we talked about CD8s versus CD4s. CD8s had the function of killing using perforin and granzyme. CD4s turned on these different transcription factors that allowed them to make different cytokines. Well, NK cells are kind of like CD8s, and these other ILCs are making those same transcription factors the CD4s are making. Oh, my gosh. And one of those types of ILCs, ILC1, the one that uses TBAT, is really good at getting rid of things like intracellular bacteria, parasites, and viruses. Intracellular parasites. Does that sound familiar? That sounds familiar because of why, Emma? That's what TH1 cells do. ILC cells have the same transcription factor as TH1 cells, and they basically are, act, are innate-like cells that tend to be acting against the same kind of microbes. ILC2s are acting against extracellular parasites. Oh my gosh, extracellular parasites are the things that TH2 cells re respond against, and it's the same transcription factor. ILC3s act against extracellular bacteria and fungi. That's the same thing as TH17, and it's the same transcription factor. Um, and in fact, if we look at some of these different types of ILCs, they tend to make specific cytokines. So ILC1s make interferon gamma. ILC2s make IL-4, 5, and 13. ILC3s make IL-17. 
Any of that sound familiar? So I'm getting some yes head shakes. How is this familiar? Yeah, Joel. Yeah, these are the same cytokines that those CD4 T cells make. So on the previous slide, you saw that ILC1s did the same transcription factor as TH1s. They do the same function, and that's also shown over here on this slide. And they even make the same cytokines. So it's basically like an innate-ish version of a TH1. ILC2 is sort of like an innate-ish version of a TH2. Same transcription factor, same cytokines, same effects. ILC3 is sort of an innate-ish version of TH17. Same transcription factor, same cytokine, same effects. And NK cells seem to be this sort of innate-ish version of a CTL. Um, so all of these are um, working with receptors that are not made by VDJ recombination. They may not be as specific to any particular microbe, but they have a lot of the same functions and it can be involved in very similar types of responses to what we saw with some really classic adaptive immune cells. And so we realized that in some cases, you know, some of the things we thought about as being innate versus adaptive immunity weren't all as, as separate as we might have originally thought. I'm going to do the next couple slides in a slightly different order. Um, and so one of the things we sort of, you know, originally thought was, well, once upon a time, organisms uh, happened that had innate immune responses, and then suddenly they started to make adaptive immune responses, and that was it for innate immunity. Innate immunity never innovated, never changed, never got better. Innate immunity was over, and this adaptive immune response just kind of got added on top of it. And some people are like, no, 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 no. I mean, there are, like, Drosophila, they still have just innate immunity. So maybe their innate immune responses, you know, evolved, and that was sort of different than adaptive immunity. But what we really realized is that these two responses in all organisms that have both have been co-evolving together. The idea of having that kind of nice, specialized response that's like a CTL is a pretty good idea evolutionarily. Some of those organisms that don't have adaptive responses still evolved that kind of response, um, even though they couldn't do VDJ or things like that. And so um, what I want you to realize here is that we're, we're seeing some, um, there's shades of gray with innate versus adaptive immunity instead of this really discrete um, set of things. This has also become... Um, sh uh, shown in another area of innate immunity, um, which is that there is this new area that a lot of immunologists are talking about called trained immunity. Um, and so, again, we usually are thinking about, um, you know, innate versus adaptive immunity as like these two little separate circles that are acting very separately. Um, and, you know, we have our B cells and T cells that undergo clonal expansion and make memory cells and all that good stuff. While our innate cells always are the same all the time. But what we've learned is that when our innate cells get activated, they can actually change. We can see that we might have enhanced responses in our activated innate cells. Some people even like to go as far as calling it innate immune memory. A little much for me. Um, and so typically we think we t tend to call this something like trained immunity, with the idea being that, say, an NK cell, or now people have also shown with a macrophage, um, some kind of uh, infection or, or exposure to a microbe, some kind of activation, will change those cells and give them different types of function. One thing that is very different about um, what we see with trained immunity 
is that when we were thinking about um, adaptive immunity and we were thinking about the entire response changing, we were often thinking about that on a population level, like a cell would become naive, may become a factor, and eventually would have progeny that would be um, memory cells or progeny that would be effector cells. Like we're changing the family tree of all the cells. It's not like that first naive cell suddenly changed itself. It's that it had progeny that were going to be different. In trained immunity, we actually think it's the cell itself that gets changed. It's not about what kind of progeny it has. That cell will make some kind of epigenetic change itself and now act differently than it acted before. Um, and so you can see this here. Um, we might have a, so at the top, um, you can kind of see um, this idea. Um, similarly, you can see this idea with a macrophage at the bottom, and I'm really going to talk about this macrophage. We have this macrophage. It might get some kind of signal through a PRR, and that might lead to changes in the cell that change chromatin structure, you know, how tightly DNA is wrapped around the histones. Um, and that cell might stay changed. And so now this cell is sort of trained, and this cell might respond better than it did before. It might make more cytokine. Um, and so we can perhaps see some differences. There have been some arguments about trained immunity and things going on with COVID and all sorts of stuff. There's one big trial that people are trying to have about it. Um, we don't know what's going on. It's still very much kind of the new cutting edge kind of thing. But the idea here is that I want you to realize that there are some places where innate immunity might have some of these beneficial properties of adaptive immunity. Um, and that's, you know, good because there are a whole bunch of organisms like plants and invertebrates that don't have adaptive immunity. It would still be kind of good for them to like learn from a first response. Um, and so things like that trained immunity, that epigenetic modification on the cell when that cell is activated that might be antigen independent could still be really beneficial to those organisms. And we've kept that beneficial response. We've just added onto it our antigen dependent memory response. Um, and so I point all of this out um, partially because this is um, kind of the new era of immunology. A lot of immunology is thinking, a lot of immunologists are thinking about this. Part of me is always like, if I just, you know, like cut out where I talk about ILCs, would it be okay? And I feel like there are some like modern immunologists who would be like, no, that would be sacrilege. They're so important. Um, for me, I think the importance here is that you see the principles of like, look, it's the same things you've seen in different cell subsets over and over again. We're, we're seeing the same things happening again and again, um, more so than I think that like you need to know every single paper about these specific cell types, but seeing kind of the, the general um, ideas. Um, so now I'm going to switch into thinking about tolerance. And we've already heard a little bit about tolerance earlier this semester. Um, and you'll see me make some comments about some of those things we talked about earlier in the semester as well. Um, one of the, so basically the idea of tolerance, um, sometimes referred to as self-tolerance, is how we make sure that we don't make some kind of detrimental immune response to self proteins. This is how we keep ourselves from making particularly adaptive responses to self proteins because that could harm us. And if tolerance fails, then we may end up with autoimmunity. So in the how it should work situation of the immune system, we should have these tolerance mechanisms that I'm going to show you today. And then 
starting on Friday, we'll think about how they get messed up, um, leading to autoimmune diseases. Um, one thing I will mention, it's mentioned here, and we'll see this um, again uh, next time. Um, some of the reasons why tolerance might fail might be due to genetics. So someone might have some specific gene that might be a, uh, lead to problems in tolerance. Um, but there also may be other things that might happen uh, environmentally or just, you know, things that happen to you in your life, infections, whatever, that may mess up tolerance. And so we'll see some examples of that um, as we go forward. And these types of things can lead to autoimmunity. When immunologists think about tolerance as a whole, we can divide tolerance up into different parts. We've already seen this division earlier this semester, where I've told you about central tolerance, which is one kind of tolerance. Central tolerance is a mechanism of tolerance that happens while we are developing the cell in a primary lymphoid organ. So it's sort of something that happens to the cell during that cell's development. And so this was um, a slide that I showed you earlier when we were thinking about central tolerance and B cells. So here you can see um, B cell central tolerance. When we talked about B cell central tolerance, we came up with an issue with B cell central tolerance that might let those autoreactive, those self-reactive cells make it through this process and end up in the periphery where they could cause us harm. You know, we, we saw a flaw in the plan. Um, so what was the flaw in the plan that we saw with B cell central tolerance? What's the big problem, the big sort of loophole in B cell central tolerance? Yeah, Olivia. Um, not necessarily, because here, if we actually have a cell that's getting no signal, it can leave. So that's not as much of a B cell problem. Where does B cell central tolerance occur? Emma? In the bone marrow. Andrew, what were you going to say? OK, in the bone marrow. All right. So there's a problem that's sort of related to in the bone marrow. Michaela? So in the bone marrow, we have kind of proteins that are made everywhere, but we don't have a lot of tissue-specific proteins. So if there's some protein that's made in the eye or some protein that's made in the ovary or whatever, the B cell doesn't get a chance to test if it's autoreactive in the bone marrow. And so it's going to be able to leave the bone marrow. It's going to seem like it's not. Uh, autoreactive, and yet it is going to be autoreactive to something that wasn't found in the bone marrow. So does that kind of seem like a problem? Like you all probably had self-reactive B cells that probably left your bone marrow, right? You might look at this and be like, oh, no, disaster. There's one other issue that comes up with B cell biology um, that I want to mention here. And the other issue that I want to mention with B cell biology has to do with the germinal center reaction. So remember that when we saw the germinal center reaction, we saw um, a B cell undergo this process of random mutation, some random point mutations in its variable regions of the heavy and light chain with the idea of changing up the binding site. And this was totally random. You just sort of changed up the binding sites in all million progeny. And some of them 
make better binding sites. Some of them make worse binding sites. You know, sometimes you destroyed the binding site. Sometimes you made it better. And then you go take that cell and you retest it against antigen and try to, you know, just have the ones that got better binding sites get a signal and move forward. So that's the germinal center reaction as we talked about. One little flaw in the plan of the germinal center reaction is we're making random mutations to these B cells. It's possible that when we mutate the B cell receptor, we could turn what used to be a non-self-reactive B cell receptor into a self-reactive one. So maybe when that B cell left the bone marrow, it wasn't self-reactive. But when it picked up mutations in the germinal center, it turned self-reactive. It mutated into a self-reactive receptor. This seems not great also, right? This seems like a definite way we can end up with some autoimmunity. Okay, now let's think a little bit about what we saw with central tolerance and T cells. Just like in the B cell case, we thought about some issues with central tolerance and T cells. What was the big issue with central tolerance and T cells? Yeah, Vicki. Exactly. So every T cell that leaves the thymus had a low affinity for self-antigen. Every T cell that leaves the thymus is a little bit self-reactive. So we don't have the same problem we had in B cells because, remember, we're making all those tissue-specific antigens using air. But we got this other big problem that... Um, Every single T cell that comes out of the thymus is a little bit self-reactive. So if we take this T cell problem that I'm telling you about now, and we take the B cell problems I told you about on the previous two slides, how often do you think it is that self-reactive B cells or T cells end up hanging out in the periphery? You think that's very common? Do you think you have one right now hanging out in your periphery or not? So you're shaking heads. What do you think, Andrew? Uh, well, with central tolerance, it should be the Right. But so, so my question is, did any self-reactive T cells get out of your thymus or bone marrow? Yes. You, you might look at this and be like, yeah, absolutely. I am sure that I have self-reactive B. Like, I, sometimes people will look at this information and be like, oh, my gosh, how am I alive if all of these things were happening in my B cells and T cells? Would fall? Like, look at how many flaws, like loopholes, all sorts of bad T cells and B cells got out. And they're, like, very worried. Um, these are some data on some of the most common autoimmune diseases. We're going to come back to this slide, so don't worry about like knowing every single detail of this slide. The reason why I'm showing you this is that you can see the prevalence of some of these autoimmune diseases, which, as I said, are some of the most common ones. And you can see that, you know, one in 50. So that's 2% of people. Or one in 100, 1% of people. One in 200, half a percent, and on and on. Sometimes if you look at this and think about central tolerance, you're like, whoa, that's really low. Like, 100% of people should have autoimmunity based on that central tolerance business. And yet, it's only these kind of small percents. And so, sort of, there's, there might be a little bit of a disconnect here. Fortunately, Andrew has solved the disconnect for us. Andrew correctly pointed out kind of where we're going with this which is that we've got another layer of tolerance. Central tolerance isn't the only thing that we're going to rely on. There's sort of this second layer of tolerance mechanisms that deal with potentially self-reactive B cells and T cells in the periphery. And so the things that we saw so far have all been central tolerance that are happening in those primary lymphoid organs. And now when we look at peripheral tolerance, we're going to see what happens to the cell once it gets out into the peripheral tissue.
Um, and hopefully the idea is that there are going to be, um, you know, a few different ways that we can um, deal with this problem. Um, so when I sort of first started TAing immunology and sort of thinking about teaching immunology, um, the person I TA'd for liked to talk about peripheral tolerance as the six ways peripheral tolerance happens. And so I'm still going to keep, I divide them into six because he divided them into six. And so we're going to think about those six different ways that these peripheral tolerance mechanisms happen. Some of them are more likely to happen to B cells. Some of them are more likely to happen to T cells. We're just going to kind of think about them a little bit big picture here. Um, some of them are going to be like super straightforward and I'm going to have like one slide and you're going to be like, yeah, duh. And some of them are going to be less straightforward. Um, and so just know that we're basically going through the six. Um, when I looked at the slides, I felt like I, if I don't get through all the slides, I'm going to either run out of time on number five or number six. So we may not get all the way through them today and have to do the rest of them on uh, Friday. Um, so in all six of these types of uh, peripheral tolerance um, can be phrased in a way that starts with clonal. So it's clonal something, clonal something else, clonal a third thing, as we're going to list them. If you had to think about a way that you might want to make peripheral tolerance work, you want to not have a self-reactive B cell or T cell, what can you imagine as a way that you could make that not be a thing? I'm trying to like say this in as neutral a way as possible. Yeah. Okay, so maybe we energize the cell and we're gonna come back to thinking about energizing the cell. What else could you do? Yeah. Just delete the cell, just kill the cell. It's a problem, you just kill it. And in fact, the first mechanism is clonal deletion. Um, and so we sometimes will see that when a self-reactive cell um, interacts with um, self-antigen in the periphery, that cell will be deleted. There's a lot that we don't understand about that. Like, how does the cell know it's a self-antigen and not a foreign antigen? Um, some of it may have to do with, like, frequency of stimulation and exhaustion. Um, a lot of that's not really clear. But one possibility is deletion. One other thing I'll just hint at you, hint for next time is when we think about how we break each of these, so how some of these can go wrong, deletion's not really breakable. Like, you can't bring a cell back from the dead. If you kill the cell, it's dead. It, it, you're done. Um, so this is one that you're not going to see in terms of breaking tolerance. Um, in the same way, because I can't bring cells back from the dead. The second mechanism is the one that Andrew mentioned, which is clonal energy. Um, and so you've actually already learned clonal energy. You just didn't know you were learning a peripheral tolerance mechanism. Um, because remember, for a T cell in, to become activated, it requires a signal from signal one and signal two. Um, we need both the peptide to be presented on MHC and we need the antigen presenting cell to have received a signal from a PRR to make this co-stimulatory molecule B7. So our T cell gets signal one and signal two and our T cell is activated. If our T cell only gets signal one then uh, and no signal two, then that's probably a self antigen because there was no PRR stem to force this APC to make B7. So our T cell is getting signal one without signal two, and that T cell becomes energized. And that energized cell, even if it is stimulated again later with signal one and signal two, is off. Um, and that cell is going to stay energized. Um, as I um, I've sort of highlighted, yeah, if like there's a super emergency, crazy, sledgehammery situation, that cell can get turned back on. But just assume it's not, unless like 
it's the apocalypse. Or at least the body's version of the apocalypse. <laughs> um, and so this is a peripheral tolerance mechanism where those T cells that maybe made it out of the thymus um, and then interact with a self antigen get turned off so that they can't make a response. So yay peripheral tolerance. Um, so that one's also relatively straightforward. Um, the third one is one that people don't think of very often, but it also is one that follows just straight off of other things we've talked about this semester. Um, it's real, and it really is one that we think about a lot with B cells. So when I think about this third mechanism, I usually think about B cells. And this is being a way to, to deal with um, autoreactive B cells in particular. What is a key thing that a B cell needs in order to be fully activated? Remember how like I had to tell you some B cell stuff at the beginning of the semester, and then I had to stop before I could tell you the rest of the B cell story? Because there was something that I had to tell you about first before I could tell you the whole B cell story, because B cells need something in their activation. B cells need help from a T cell in order to become fully activated, right? And so what we can see that particularly works really well for B cells is something known as clonal helplessness. A, if we have an autoreactive B cell that leaves the bone marrow, maybe that B cell leaves the bone marrow because it responds to a tissue antigen that wasn't present in the bone marrow, okay? So that B cell gets out of the bone marrow, it's all ready to go. Well, in order for that B cell to become activated in the periphery, it, that B cell would need to, in, to come across a T cell that responds to the same antigen so that the B cell can present antigen to the T cell and get at, fully activated. Well, if the T cell got deleted in the thymus, because the T cell saw the self antigen in the thymus, because remember, all of the peripheral things are in the thymus, that T cell gets deleted. The B cell is just going to float around the body looking for its help from its T cell and never get it. And so we can see this mechanism of clonal helplessness, where basically our B cells just can't get help because the helper cell, the helper T cell, got killed in the thymus. And so we um, can have this as a way that those autoreactive B cells can be kept from being activated. Yep. Mm -hmm. No, so, so they're naive. They don't, they don't get to the point of being activated, nor do they get to the point of being energized. They're just naive B cells that can never kind of get to the next phase of life. Um, so that one's pretty straightforward. Um, again, so that's three already, and they're all basically things that kind of you've already thought about and are pretty easy. Guess what? Number four is also something you already thought about that's pretty easy. Um, so the fourth uh, mechanism of peripheral tolerance is clonal suppression, which is a fancy way of saying we have Tregs. Um, and so we've got Tregs around who can actually turn off autoreactive cells. Um, here it's showing those Tregs turning off um, other autoreactive T cells, they could also turn off autoreactive B cells. And so we have Tregs that might respond to self antigen. Remember, some of them came out of the thymus and were responding to self antigen. And, uh, and they were responding kind of highly to self antigen. So if they happen to see some, their antigen, they're going to be like, whoa, everybody calm down. Um, and start to, um, regulate or inhibit other responses that are going on at that same time. 
Alternatively, if we had a T cell that was getting activated when there was no inflammation, that T cells could become a Treg. That could kind of be a sign that, yeah, when this antigen's around, we're not actually in an inflammatory state and there's not actually a microbe. And that cell could then um, go on and regulate or inhibit other cells. So clonal suppression, again, one that's pretty straightforward off of stuff that you've already heard about. So the first four are the easy ones, but also they're the ones that are less fun. So the final two are a little harder, but they're also both involve fun stories that I get to tell you. Um, and so one, so the fifth mechanism, and the one I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about, is a mechanism known as clonal deviation. When I started teaching immunology, and when I started really thinking about immunology, clonal deviation always felt kind of hard to explain, and kind of like a thing I was talking about in a very like hypothetical-ish way. There have been a whole bunch of really cool papers in the last five, I don't remember exactly what year one of them came out, we'll say five, years that have actually shown specific autoimmune diseases related to clonal deviation and are things that like now make sense in my brain in a whole new way. And so for a while, clonal deviation was kind of like, this could happen, but now there are lots of examples where it will. Um, if you, so I'm going to spend some time talking about deviation today. If you feel like deviation is a little confusing after today, that's okay. One of the things that I'm going to do in my examples on Friday is actually talk about those specific cases where deviation is involved in certain disease states, where we actually like really worked out the details of it. And I know for me, even when I read those papers, it clicked in a new way and helped me understand it in a new way. So know that like you should get the big picture here and hopefully it'll click maybe with those examples even more on Friday. So the idea with clonal deviation is that different types of responses, particularly different helper T cell subset responses, are appropriate in different situations. If you make the correct type of C4 T cell helper response, then you get rid of the pathogen and you have a healthy response and everyone lives happily ever after. But if you make the wrong kind of helper T cell response, then you might actually get damage instead of protection. Um, and so the idea is really has to do with the fact that you could make in response to different microbes kind of a Th1 or a Th2 or a Th17 or a T follicular helper cell. And if something goes wrong in which one happens during that response, you could get a really pathologic response instead of a protective response. This example uh, is showing um, a situation where we've got a naive CD4 T cell, so sort of our, you know, cell that has not yet decided what to uh, what type of helper T cell to become that is interacting with um, an antigen presenting cell during helminth infection. So that's infection with a parasitic worm. If that T cell happens to receive cytokines and signals that push that cell to become a Th1 cell, then we're going to activate macrophages. We're going to make IgG. Well, the IgG is useless, and the macrophages actually cause more damage during a parasite infection. So you can see interferon gamma facilitates parasite infection. Inflammatory response further disrupts infected tissue. So if that T cell happens to get the right cytokines, to make a Th1 response in this situation, then we're going to get 
damaged and we're going to get severe disease. Alternatively, if this T cell is deviated away from this bad response, I don't know, it went to some like program to tell it to be good, or more specifically, it got the cytokines that told it to become a Th2 cell during that activation. Now, we're going to make IL-13, IL-5, we're going to make IgE, we're going to make IL-3 uh, IL and IL-9, we're going to get mast cells, we're going to get mucus secretion, we're going to do a whole bunch of things that are really good for getting rid of parasites. And in the end, this is going to be protective, and we're going to get rid of parasites. So here it's really kind of about what direction that original T cell got pushed in, and does it get pushed in as sort of, does it go towards good or towards evil, um, based on the cytokines that it sees. Um, you can see an example of this here, as well as um, an example of this um, on the next slide as well. Um, one of the things that we know this is uh, is that there can be certain genetic predisposition towards making a Th1 response or making a Th2 response. So it turns out that different organisms might be kind of like Th1 biased or Th2 biased. You know, unless you really push them, they're always going to make Th1. Unless you really push them, they're always going to make Th2. I am relatively certain this I, this will sort of come up today. We'll sort of also come up a bunch more uh, on Friday. I am relatively certain that I am a Th2 biased person. Um, and that whenever when I see an antigen, if something else doesn't happen, I get a Th2 response. A Belbsy mouse is also usually known as a uh, relatively Th2 biased type of mouse. So, like, genetically, it seems like there's some predisposition in certain cases. If you um, infect a Balbsi mouse with Leishmania, so this is a parasite, so you can kind of imagine it like a Helminth parasite like you saw before. If you infect Balbsi mice with Leishmania, um, which is in the yellow, the Balbsi mice all die within 70 days after infection. So, you know, in the first 20, after 20 something days, a few of them die and then a few more die. And so more and more of them die in response to this path, this microbe. If you do the exact same thing, but you treat that Belb C mouse with an antibody that blocks IL-4, now that Belb C mouse cannot make a Th2 response. You've blocked the ability to get a Th2 response. Instead, the mouse has sort of no choice but to make a Th1 response because we blocked the Th2. When you do that and you block the Th2 response as well as infect with this parasite, the mice all live. And that tells us that, in fact, it was the Th2 response that was the problem. The Th2 response caused the disease in these mice. And if we could just figure out ways to make them make a Th1 response instead, they'd be just fine. It's the same thing in people. Your responses may get shifted one direction or another. Um, in this example, um, we're looking at mice either that have, that are normal mice or mice that are missing the gene for TBET. What's TBET? Yeah, Kyra. The transcription factor. What was it involved with? Th1. So if you have mice that are missing Tbet, what does that mean about their helper T cell subsets? Yeah, Emma. So they can't make a Th1 response. They might make too much of a Th2 response. Because remember, Th1 responses also negatively impact Th2. Some of this deviation thing is about that negative regulation. So, th so Tbet mice are going to make a Th2 response to things, or Tbet deficient mice. Normal mice are going to make 
a normal response to things. And what you can notice is that if you look at the mice that are normal, they have normal airways. What you should notice here is like there's a hole right there and there's a hole right there. That's where the breathing goes. Here are the mice that are just missing TBET, but then running around in the mouse facility. They can't make a good TH1 response. They're making too many TH2 responses. And what you can notice is that their airway is full of cells because those are inflammatory cells that have trafficked in. And you can start to see issues in sort of wound healing in their airways. These mice um, are genetically predisposed to asthma because they're making way too much of a TH2 response, not enough of a TH1 response. And they will usually end up eventually in a situation like this. This is that hole. That's where the breathing is supposed to go. But it's full of mucus. So you might imagine, kind of hard for them to breathe. And you can also see all of these cells that have come into the tissue layer of inflammation that shouldn't be there. And so this might happen because you're, these mice are making too much of a Th2 response. If something, we could figure out a way to push them back towards Th1, then they wouldn't have these kind of issues. Um, and so um, clonal deviation is a big sort of idea uh, and a big thought in terms of thinking about immunopathology. Most of our most famous examples, at least until, like I said, like five years ago, um, when we got some other really cool examples, so one of them is still works part of this, relate to infection with these microbes called helmets. And so if you look at this figure from your textbook that's talking about clonal deviation, it's specifically telling you about helminth infection. Helminths are parasitic worms. Um, these are some of the helminths um, that exist. So they largely include roundworms, flukes, and tapeworms. Um, and so things like tapeworm infection, um, ascariasis, Draconiasis, elephantiasis, hookworm, trichinosis, schistosomiasis, all of these types of things that are involved some eukaryotic multicellular organism leading to infection. Um, and typically, um, here you can see, and this is just a schistosome larva. This isn't even a full grown schistosome with a whole bunch of white blood cells around it. Um, those white blood cells are not eating this. They are not phagocytosing it. The only way that we are going to be able to kill this multicellular eukaryotic parasite is by secreting toxic molecules at it and trying to actually destroy it that way. That is really what our eosinophils and our mast cells are doing. And so ideally for a helminth infection, a Th2 response is a really great type of response. And you can see here's a mast cell before, it's full of all sorts of granules, full of toxic products. When that mast cell gets activated, it basically just shoots out all of those granules. You can see they're lost. But that's because they all got shot at the helmet or something like that. If you look at the information here about helminth infection and these types of infections, I want you to just think for a second about the infections that are listed here and how frequently in your life you have worried about having them or whether you have had any of these infections to your knowledge. Does any of this sound super familiar really to you? Mm, not, not, not really. Like not, doesn't seem like a huge part of your life in a lot of cases. It turns out that helminth infection is only found in some parts of the world right now and not in other parts of the world. So we have done a lot of work um, to get rid of helminth infection. You guys might be aware of um, signs about Bill Campbell, who is a RISE fellow at Drew, who won the Nobel Prize a few years ago. Yeah, it's because he made a drug to stop helminth infection. <laughs> um, and when we look at the world, we largely see a lot of helminth infection in the areas that are 
of the world that are shown here in red. So that's where we tend to see large amounts of helminth infections. Um, and this is very much a kind of broad scale, only high, moderate, low. We could make more levels if we really want. What has been noticed for a very long time was that there's a weird sort of statistical association on this. Because on the left, you can see the areas of the world where there are a lot of people with autoimmune diseases. Red is most, um, and you can see the opposites. And so if you look at these data, what type of maybe hypothesis or what idea might you come up with from these data? So, yes, but we should be more specific. It's specifically about helminth infection. So having helminth infection protects you from autoimmunity. Or not having helminth infection makes you more likely to have autoimmunity. You kind of phrase it either way. You know, and you can think of that as like a hypothesis, right, that someone could test. Um, this is known as the hygiene hypothesis. And there have been a number of different observations that have all kind of suggested similar things. And the basic idea with the hygiene hypothesis is that certain infections earlier in life bias you towards making more TH2s or TH1s. And if you make more TH2s because you're getting helminth infection, you don't get autoimmunity. And if you make more TH1s, you get autoimmunity, is kind of what the idea has been. Um, some other pieces of this, um, and you can see that in particular, when we talk about the hygiene hypothesis, we are actually often talking about a lot of allergic disorders. Um, so allergies, asthma, eczema, rhinitis. Um, it does, there has been, Statistical associations, I'm noting as statistical associations because sometimes students are like, this is the mechanism. And I'm like, no, we don't know the mechanism. We just have a statistical association. Um, between people who come from more westernized countries having more allergies, people who come from smaller families having more allergies, presumably because maybe there were more fewer pathogens in the house, um, sort of the more affluent urban homes, as and the that's actually less useful than the, did you have livestock um, that might have given you more microbes? Um, and things like that actually changing how much uh, of this balance between Th1 and Th2 you might have and making you more susceptible to um, allergy. Um, and so similarly, these are some of the things that have also been statistically associated um, so it turns out that people are statistically less likely to have allergies if they have older siblings, so if they're not the oldest kid, because um, presumably, like, your house is cleaner for the first kid, and then when the later kids, you're like, yeah, whatever. Um, if you go to daycare, you're less likely to um, have allergies, presumably because you're around other grubby little kids. Um, if you grew up on a farm um, or if you had a lot of helminth infections, Whereas if you were an only child or sort of the oldest sibling, you tend to have more allergies, um, Western people from westernized countries, things like that. And so it seems as though this balance, this deviation, um, may be something that is going on worldwide. Um, I'll just mention there is sort of one other hypothesis out there about um, the hygiene hypothesis. Um, the idea is that in our population, there is a range of immune responses. Some people's immune responses are low. Some people's immune responses are high. If you have, if people are in, in our population, we're all infected with parasites, then our immune responses would kind of all be shifted a little lower. And so we wouldn't have many people who are up at the high range having autoimmune disease. But if we don't have 
parasites in our population, we're all shifted to a bit of a higher um, immune response. We don't have suppression from the parasites, and maybe that is why there are too many people with high levels of immune responses and allergy. So this is sort of a competing hypothesis that is out there. Um, but all of these things are related to clonal deviation, the fifth of our mechanisms of tolerance. And we're going to talk about the one that honestly often ends up being everybody's favorite um, on Friday before we get into breaking tolerance. So I will see you guys on Friday and be on the lookout for some emails.